Skenaga, everybody. Goodminds.com is proud to present 13 Moons, 13 Reads, showcasing Indigenous authors, poets, and illustrators from across Turtle Island with cultural teachings of the 13 Moons on Turtle's Back. I'm your host, Janet Rogers, a Mohawk Tuscarora poet, a media producer, and a brand new publisher with the Ojisto Publishing label. And it is a great honor to present this Indigenous author series to you. And I'm very excited to introduce you to today's very special guest, Tanya Talega, who's joining us. But first, before we get to the chat with Tanya, we're going to be learning about this month's moon. We're going to learn about the Zagi Bagnawi, Dizit's moon from Debbie Beach Ducharme. And Debbie is Ojibwe from Lake Manitoba First Nations, also known as Dog Creek uh, Treaty 2 Territory. So welcome, Debbie, and thank you so very much for sharing your very important moon teachings with us. Hello, everybody. My name is Ritzelman from Lake Manitoba First Nation. My English name is Deborah Beach Ducharme. So today we're going to be learning a new moon. And just as a reminder, 13 moons on the turtle's back. For many Anishinaabeg across Turtle Island, the turtle's back or upper shell is the lunar calendar. This is our way of dating seasonal changes in all the natural events that occur during each season. There are 13 scoots and 28 smaller ones on the turtle's upper shell. <clears throat> so the 13 larger scoots represent the 13 moons and the 28 Smaller scoots represent each of the day, the 28 days of the month. <clears throat> each moon is given a name for an important event that occurred during this lunar cycle. Moon names can change and vary from group to group depending on the climate, terrain, or important local events. At the beginning of each moon, story are told stories are told about events that occur since the last full moon. These stories are passed on from one generation to the next. So the Moon we are learning about this month <clears throat> is Zagi Diwani Gizis, which is the budding moon. <clears throat> Buds are opening on trees. Many flowers, shrubs, and trees are beginning to blossom. Summer is just around the corner. This is the budding moon. <clears throat> Zagi Diwani. Jesus. Next month, we will be learning about Wabigamana Jesus, which is Blossom Moon. So let's work together, Anishinaabek, Dinuamagana, to pass on this traditional teaching to our to Abdinojia, our children. Miigwech. Anin Anishinaabek. Uh, thanks again, Debbie. Tanya Talega is Ojibwe author and truth teller. Her books include All Our Relations, Finding the Path Forward, Seven Fallen Feathers, Racism, Death, and Hard Truths in a Northern City. So welcome, Tanya, and let us know how you, if there's anything else that we need to know about you to do your own introductions, where you're um, transmitting to us from today. Bushu, anin Tanya Talega, nigis nikas, ka musko pimojija pinishish, nigis nikas, makwa dodam. I am so honored to be here. I'm so excited to be talking to you, Janet. Like after all this time, I feel like I know you virtually uh, <laughs> in like the cyber world. Um, and um, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, oh, that's, that's the sweetest thing for you to say. And are you joining us from Toronto today? I am, I'm here in Tecoronto. Um, yeah, and I've been here for most of the time during the pandemic, actually, almost all of it. Was right. Like, one tiny escape back up north, but other than that, it's been here. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a tough go. Toronto's um, experiencing a lockdown like no other place. Huh? But you know what? Before we go down that road too far, I do want to congratulate you on um, the film Spirit to Soar uh, that got featured. Was it the debut at the Toronto Hot Docs Festival? Yeah. And congratulations on that. How was how was that experience? Um, being a filmmaker and being on, on that end of filmmaking. Uh, Miigwech. Um, we do a whole other show on that. Um, to be <laughs> <honest>. <laughs> it was, um, 
like uh, nothing I've ever experienced. I honestly had no idea what I was doing. And um, I am so grateful to have the people in my life that sort of showed me the way. Um, and that includes uh, Jennifer Podemski from the beginning, uh, who was with us, and then Michelle DeRosier, um, who was our, my co-director. And she is uh, she lives in Thunder Bay, has lived in Thunder Bay for about 30 years, um, but she's from Eagle Lake. and. Um, yeah, it's just, it was a process and it was really hard. It was probably one of the hardest, um, hardest things I've ever done. Uh, it was very much as difficult as writing both my books, mm -hmm. if not more. Um, it was tough. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a different uh, way of, of storytelling. It's a different method of storytelling. And yes, indeed. Uh, I know. How long did that take you to make that documentary? Four years. Oh uh, no, four, four years. Oh. I, uh, yeah, off and on. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of off, like I'd start and then I'd go, I'd leave it and then I'd go back to it. Um, and then there was COVID. Um, yeah, it was, it was about four years so, um, which is hard to believe, but it takes a long time to put films together and it is a different form of storytelling for sure. You know, visually minded, um, which is a lot different from what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to focus on the books today because we are uh, operating from Good Minds and they're a book distributor, Indigenous book distributors. So I wanted to start with a quote from Seven Fallen Feathers, uh, a quote that, uh, that says, as Indians, we have to go above and beyond to prove we exist, but also to prove our deaths are unjust when they're unjust. And to me, this is a quote that you could probably start every lecture, every interview, every uh, panel discussion with, drop the mic and leave the stage because it, that's the, the, the bottom line of the truth that you present in, in the work that you do. And given the fact that, you know, now the, we have a lot of ears opening, we have a lot of, um, uh, I would say, generally speaking, people on side, I'm wondering if you, when you, when you drop truth bombs like that, do you still get um, a bit of pushback? And if so, how do you react to that? It's a really, really great question. Oh yeah, you know, every time we talk about this, every time we talk about the truth, there's always a reaction, um, especially if you're dealing with a, um, well, if you're dealing with a non-Indigenous crowd, for sure, there is so much like disbelief, this can't be happening. Um, I used to get angry um, actually uh, every time I would talk about Seven Fallen Feathers um, after it was released, it was inevitable. Um, somebody would come up to me at the end of my discussion and they would say, I had no idea. I had no idea what was happening in that school down the road or across town. Um, I just didn't know. And I always like used to get mad and I would just, after you hear it so many times, you're just like, really? Right. You really didn't know? How could you not have known that something was a little weird, strange? Yeah. You know, and I remember having that conversation with Murray Sinclair and he said to me, don't be angry with them. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, they probably didn't know or they weren't told the truth because Canada has a history of looking away and you have an entire generation of children that have grown up in the public and Catholic school system that were not taught the true history of this country. And that's very, very well said because all the people that are lawmakers now are police officers, our editors, our um, swim instructors. They grew up not knowing the truth of this country. They weren't taught about residential schools. They weren't taught about Indian hospitals. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of truth telling yet to be done. And uh, I think about that often when I get angry, um, but it's, it's the way Canadian society is, right? It's that, that quiet racism, which is an indifference that is deadly. Yeah, yeah, well said. It's um, and maybe 
we can call it a generational uh, ignorance. Um, whereas, you know, I think uh, people who exist in the, in the now, uh, in the contemporary times that we exist in, there seems to be no excuse not to know these histories, these truths, these realities that we uh, as Indigenous people know and, and are experiencing in the current time. So it's, uh, so maybe it is a generational thing and I'm really glad that you mentioned Justice Marie St. Clair because that he's the next person I want to quote uh, from the podcast that you've created through with Audible. Um, and that is he's saying in his own voice, he says, racism is ingrained in the institutions with, and in individuals themselves. So how much of what you do, Tanya, as a journalist and a storyteller and now a filmmaker is meant to address and change the ingrained racism. And do you feel you need to take that on? Is that your mission? Hmm. Um, I think, um, no, uh, you know, my mission is to tell our stories, right? If, if that's a mission, um, uh, that it's my honor to tell our stories. Um, it's, uh, it's my joy to tell our stories if I'm able to do so. And um, if people learn as a result of what we do, non-Indigenous people, good, you know, so be it. But my main vehicle is definitely, I just want to tell our stories. Um, and um, I want to do it in a way that I am, I feel comfortable in, and that's through community, you know, like Seven Fallen Feathers came together. That was a community effort. I always said to people, and I do say, uh, many hands made this book. Um, and that is true as well with all our relations. Many hands, like everyone who gifted me with their stories to make that book. And it's the same with the podcast series and, um, and with the film. It's all, it's like, it's a community effort. I do none of it like alone, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, in Seven Fallen Feathers, I mean, Christian Morriso did the cover of the book. Yes, I love that. He gave me the title. And in our film, um, Spirit to Soar, all of the syllabics in the film are done by Ricky Strang, um, Reggie Bushy's brother. He's one of the Seven Fallen Feathers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so community is at the heart of, I think, our storytelling. Um, I just happen to be the coordinator, and <laughs> that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, clear, clear enough. Yeah, um, and you grew up outside of Thunder Bay, is that right? In Rate, is it Rate? No, no, that was my mom. My oh. mom grew up in uh, Wraith and Graham, so it's the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation. Okay. Um, it's a, it's a like a little tiny, tiny. I don't even think you'd call it a town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Houses at the side of the road. Oh. That's basically what it is in the bush okay um, and so she grew up there and in Graham um I grew up I was born in Scarborough and um then I grew up north of Toronto uh, okay. and I would spend my summers uh going up with my mother okay. to where she was from um, okay. my father was Polish right so yeah and I always say you know I always say that because it's important to know that like that's 100% Polish on that side just like that's it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a beautiful combination. You look at look at what they made. Look what they made. But you know, I wanted to ask about the um, uh, re remoteness of the communities where the students who met their demise in Thunder Bay uh, came from. I wanted to uh, ask you if you thought that uh, culture shock uh, played any role in in uh, what they experienced and ultimately, you know. What, uh, how they met their death there in Thunder Bay. And if you could talk about that a little bit. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I think for sure. I think that um, um, colonization in many forms um, contributed to the deaths of the seven children mm -hmm. and it contributes and continues to contribute to the death of many of our people. And in particular, when you look at the seven fallen feathers, I mean, all of the kids, they were from communities um, that were about four, five, six hundred kilometers away from where they had to attend high school, um, and the communities um, in our our north, um, in Anishinaabe Asking Nation territory, uh, Treaty Number Nine and parts of Treaty Five, 
they're small communities, you know, you have communities of 300, 400 people. I think the biggest one is around 2,000 people, 3,000 people, maybe, maybe Pecanshacum, mm -hmm. it's got maybe 3,000 mm -hmm. um, or Sandy Lake. Um, but it's, there are no traffic lights in these communities. There are no stores other than the Northern store. And we all know what that's like. It's like, you know, the Northern store is like this catch all where you can buy rubber boots or ham or a PlayStation. Uh, no one hangs out in that store. It's not like a mall. There's no restaurants. There's just, it's completely different. And so you have to go from there. And a lot of our communities in the North too, um, English is not your first language, right? Um, Sutra Creek. It's Anishinaabewin. Um, it's like the language is different. So you're learning, like you come to Thunder Bay as a 13, 14, 15 year old kid. And it's got to seem like Las Vegas, honestly. There's um, like, I've not been to Las Vegas, but the, the sights and the sensories and the sounds and everything, um, the subway, uh, you know, sandwich shop, Tim Hortons, um, traffic lights. Yeah. You have to learn how to ride a bus, how to yeah. cross the street. Yeah. Like, that's a lot. And for a long time, like, people outside our community never really gave it much thought. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and now, uh, you know, you're looking at the details of, of uh, how that story transpired. And as a journalist, and being having written the book now, you're on the other side. You're you're conversing with a lot of journalists who are interviewing you, and I'm just wondering if um, I, I've, I've watched a few of the interviews uh, you've done in mainstream um, uh, media, and I noticed that at sometimes the journalists are kind of taking advantage of the time that they have with you to make you answer questions about all Indigenous issues. You know. Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 let's talk about the water issue. Now let's talk about missing murdered indigenous women, you know, like all of it. And I'm just wondering, how, do, how do you react to that? How does that make you feel, Tanya? Um, I was at, I was on uh, CBC radio and I remember there was a, uh, there was a question about the election. It was during the federal election time. And the person that uh, was interviewing me asked me, what the national indigenous vote was. And I said to her, well, just hang on a second. I'm just, I'm just gonna call everyone. And I'll be <laughs> back in about, I don't know, two years or so. Just how, you know, there's no way you can um, answer any of those questions. When I try and answer, I speak from what I've seen, what I know, uh, from where I've been, you know, uh, Miskandaga. I've been to Miskanka. I, I, I know um, what continues to happen there. You know, I, I, he's just stepped down, but Chief Munias, I would talk to him all the time. I wrote about it um, with the women too. I, as a journalist, I looked in a lot of, um, into certain stories with murder, missing indigenous women and girls. Um, so I try, and when I do speak of those things, I speak from those perspectives of knowing that. But um, yeah, and from the people that I hear stories from, I mean, like uh, Saul Mamakwa, who is the MPP for Kuwaitnong in Northwestern Ontario, whose writing encompasses most of the boil water advisories in Canada, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. And, um, and also too, what's happening in Anishinaabe Aski Nation territory, um, as I've been privileged to visit many of those communities. Um, yeah, in the before time, <laughs> so uh, that's why I, I try not to answer questions too about other places right because I don't know I, I don't know what's happening in Saskatchewan you know I don't know what's happening with Coast Salish people right. or uh because and that's even where I, I write from here too because I just don't know enough and I still don't know anything like I, I feel like I'm learning constantly yeah. about our people and yeah yeah i know it's weird isn't it 
Yeah, it takes it, but is it, you know, it's, it's, we're going to learn till, you know, with the day we leave this earth and um, maybe that's what people, you know, don't really realize is like, we can't speak for everybody. We certainly can't yeah. speak for everybody. You know, we have uh, our, all of our experiences and realities are very, very different and diverse. And I remember, you know, um, there was a time, I don't know if you were ever part of the uh, Native American Journalists Association, the NAJA. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm a part of it. I was like, I don't know if I am, but I, I might be. No, actually, yeah. I don't, I don't I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I don't know how active they are these days, but I remember um, uh, I was part of that, at, you know, for a very brief little bit of time, and had the uh, great honor and, uh, and joy of uh, interviewing Duncan McHugh, who then, you know, went on and his uh, um, his career really blew up, and you know, CBC embraced him, and thank goodness, you know, he was somebody who represented us in, in with a big, big voice, a big megaphone. And um, I remember him sharing with me in the interview about the level of distrust that he experienced, even as an Indigenous uh, journalist going into Indigenous communities. I'm wondering if you experienced that and how did you navigate that going into the communities as a, as a story gatherer? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Duncan also says, don't be a story taker, right? Mm. So, um, you know, be mindful of that. And um, it's about relationship building and to be honoring the people that you're talking to and the stories that you're gathering um, and just don't fly in and fly out and say, see you later. I'm not talking to you again. Mm -hmm. um, I try not to do that. Um, I try and keep in contact with um, everyone uh, or everyone or as much as I can, you know, yeah. Facebook Messenger is I use that all the time. Um, I'm not great on Facebook, but on Facebook Messenger, I'm all over it. Okay. Yeah, that's how <laughs> we all talk to each other like you know i keep in contact with the families of the seven fallen feathers that way um some of the other people i've written about the other families for sure that's how we keep in contact and um yeah and sometimes you develop other relationships with people like even more so um you know you contact you, you talk to them more than others and but yeah i think that i think that approaching members of our community with honor and respect and as people. Yeah. And don't go into a community with a list of questions and like a pre preconceived notion of what you're looking for. Um, I always try and have a conversation with somebody because I think that that's, that's what makes people feel at ease and it's not rude. Okay. Yeah. So have a conversation, get to know them and then say, would you mind if we talked about this again and I wrote it down. Right. Yeah, excellent. There was um, also, you know, as a journalist, and you've been a journalist for a while, uh, so you have seen, you know, at a time when maybe there, uh, when we weren't covering our own stories, the majority of, of Indigenous journalists were not covering our own stories. So what have you seen uh, that has changed over the years when you have been a journalist? And what do you, what do you still see that needs to be changed um, in terms of, uh, uh, mainstream journalism in terms of you know, covering Indigenous stories? And you can be as candid as you like. <laughs> Great question. And thanks for starting that question by saying that because it's true. You know, um, when I started at the Star, it was 1995. Um, and when I walked into that newsroom, there wasn't another Indigenous journalist there. You know, like there wasn't another First Nations journalist there. There was, uh, and we did not cover our stories. We covered the stories of whatever they told us to cover, right? Whatever your editors told you to do, um, you did because you were grateful to have a job. You know, like uh, there were no mentors or people. There wasn't a stream that put us into uh, a position. Like I, I was grateful to get the job uh, at the internship at the Star when I got it. Um, so I didn't go to journalism school. I went to um, U of T and uh, I volunteered at the student newspaper there, the varsity. And then um, I was the news editor of the varsity. Um, and there was that experience, that student experience that gave me confidence and everything else and uh, to, to keep going with what I was doing. Um, and then you go into the mainstream media and I was lucky enough to get that internship. I was the only intern they took that did not go to journalism school. And um, I remember like, you know, and it's, it's true. You have to, you have to do whatever they tell you to do because you're just so grateful to be there. I was grateful to have a job and I needed to eat. 
as you know, my parents weren't wildly wealthy at all. Um, and I needed to support myself. Um, and then the more confidence you get and the, the better, you know, you become and the more you achieve, then the more you had your voice, right? And it wasn't really until um, I don't know more um, that change started coming um, for us, for me, um, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2020. Mm -hmm. That's when people started to listen. And um, it was a force of that commission, the finding of cultural genocide at the time, you know, and all of the things like, I don't, it's like a nation woke up to residential school. It's like, oh my God, why did it happen? Right. You know? right. Um, and it took that though, like all of those little things to get to where we are. And we're not even really where we need to be at all. You know, right. we still walk into newsrooms and um, how many Indigenous people are there? Um, hardly any, right? Mm -hmm. um, part of the um, Journalists for Human Rights, they've got an Indigenous reporting program um, and we, they do a report that looks at um, how many people are actually in the newsrooms, Indigenous people are in the newsrooms, and it's always so minuscule. And then it looks at what the stories that get covered. And again, that's incredibly minuscule. And yeah. it's also usually um, not stories of happiness and yeah. cooking and jam and music. It's usually other stuff, right? So. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it's... Um... You know, there's different nuances that that an indigenous uh, journalist can 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 include in a story that a non-indigenous. You know, it's not better or worse. It's just it's going to be different. Um, and I like the fact that you've kind of moved your um, experiences and life experiences from journalism into this. Uh, book writing and now into um, the Audible, the podcast. And as you're saying, it's kind of bringing us back into this oral tradition, the tradition of, um, of storytelling. And I really appreciate the fact that you've made that clear. And on that note, I'm wondering if you could share with us um, an excerpt from one of your books. Oh, <laughs> me. Yeah, it's okay. And I put my book away and I don't have my glasses on, okay. uh, but I can do this. I know I can. Okay. Um, let me see. I had a little, yes. Um, <sighs> Sorry, I had, yeah, I pricked it out on my phone, believe it or not, because I have, uh -huh. my, um, I have my book also loaded onto my phone, which is the best because it's a search engine. You just pump in a word and then oh. all of a sudden um, the, it all comes back to you. Um, so let me just see here. Sorry, I should have, I'm gonna have to look this up. I can't find it. Uh, That's good. What were you looking for? What, what part were you gonna read? Uh, notes from the blind man. I was gonna read you the part of the blind man speaking to the Cat Lake searchers. Okay. The 38, okay, I think that'll help me. Hopefully this helps. Ha, on my phone. Look okay. All right, here we are. Um, this is, um, the chapter is um, uh, notes from a blind man. These are the notes from a blind man. The blind man is an elder. He had a vision. So he told Lillian Sukunakweb, Lillian was in charge of the Webakwe First Nation community search for Jordan Labas, who went missing on February 7th, 2011. She had set up a command center on the Fort Williams side of the city and the old Canadian Red Cross office. When Jordan disappeared, members of Webakwe First Nation community traveled nearly 540 kilometers south of Thunder Bay to search for him. Dozens of them, young and old, relatives, friends, and strangers, because this is what you do when one of yours has gone missing. Some of the searchers were expert trackers known for their prowess in the bush. They traveled the winter roads and came with their trucks and their snowmobiles. Among them was the blind man. Lillian talked to the blind man. She sat down with him at a table and with a ballpoint pen, she drew out his vision on six sheets of white paper. The drawing starts with a river running in a squiggle down the center of the page. 
The river is a cam. Beside the river, there is a fence and two buildings, side by side. The note that says they are about a foot apart. The elder says that he sees train tracks on the north side of the water. On the south side, he sees Mount McKay. He sees a bridge. The blind man sees the pulp mill. He sees buildings, grain elevators. He sees an industrial warehouse storage. The place is not fenced. It is along the rail tracks. Lillian draws it all. He tells Lillian that two people met Jordan on the night he vanished. They are young, like him. There is an altercation, a scuffle. They are definitely trying to hide, says the blind man. The blind man sees the spirit of Jordan's body lying down on the ground. The snow is not very deep. Jordan's spirit sits either on top of the water or on the shore. The blind man sees Jordan's face. His face faces north. His feet face south. The blind man says the turtle spirit is near. So is the night bird. He says the bear travels at night. Then he says, the more you search, the more he vanishes. Wow. That's so heartbreaking. So heartbreaking. Well, this is a, a good example of how Indigenous people experience death. There is no finality. There is another life. And definitely the spirituality, we exercise our spirituality a little more when it is needed. So thank you for sharing. I'm just, I have shivers. This is beautiful. Thank you. That's so great. So we are uh, at the end of our air chat. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks for taking the time, Tanya. I know how busy you are. Um, what is next for you, by the way? I'm writing another book. Ah. Um, as soon as we wrap up the documentary, Spirit to Soar, um, believe it or not, we're still trying to finish it. <laughs> it's going to be shown on CBC in the next few weeks. Um, and the... Uh, Uja Cree version is going to be shown um, in three weeks as well. Well, that's a whole other story. It's either going to be Uja Cree or it's going to be Uja Boy. We still like, it all sort of fell apart at the last moment. So now we're struggling between the two to figure out where we're going to go. And wow. 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 That's what I'm doing right now to be dead honest with you. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, that's, yeah. that's where I am. And then a book. Uh, yeah. Wow. putting away the film things for a bit and just going to concentrate back on my writing good back into familiar territory, back into familiar territory. Yes, exactly. fantastic um so thanks everyone for joining us um and join us in the next moon uh which is going to be the wabi guani gizets blossom moon as we interview uh opas uh Kwakyak cree nation of northern manitoba author wilford buck i very much look forward to that wilford is the author of the uh, T.P. Squaw-E Squa, Squa uh, Kizik Night Star, uh, sorry, Night Sky Star Stories, and I Have Lived Four Lives. If you are interested in purchasing any of the books on uh, throughout this author series, please contact goodminds.com. Use the promo code hashtag 13moons13reads at the checkout to receive free shipping on your next order. That's very generous, man. Remember to order all of your Indigenous books at goodminds.com. And we thank you for supporting Indigenous-owned businesses. Um, thank you again for tuning in. Please make sure to subscribe, hit the like button, and follow uh, goodminds.com on the Facebook and on the Twitter. And comment on this video for a chance to win a signed copy of one of Tanya's books. She has, I've heard that Tanya has signed both of her books, so you get a chance to win uh, one copy and two copies are going out uh, as a prize. And we will see you during the next moon. Until then, take care. Onigawi, Nyawagua, thank you very much. And thank you again, Tanya. Uh, Bama P and Shimi Glitch. Yeah.